Please remain standing for a reading from God's Word. This reading today is from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. The Passover over of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Right. Well, good morning. If you are. to another microphone. Uh, So uh, again, Neartown means so much to us. Uh, So we just recently planted a church called the Journey Church Houston, just uh, a few minutes north of here in the Heights. And we are so encouraged by what we see the Lord doing. Even in just the last few weeks, we've celebrated three baptisms. We did a cookout in the the park as an, an outreach, an opportunity to get to share the love and kindness of Jesus Christ with our community in practical ways and introduce ourselves to the community. We're seeing visitors at our service every single week. And most importantly, we're seeing spiritual eyes being open to the goodness, the glory, and the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, that we're seeing people understand the gospel in new and fresh ways and seeing the gospel transform people's lives. So it's been an, an awesome experience. And none of that is possible without Near Town Church. So from the bottom of our hearts, we just want to extend a, a thank you to each and every single one of you for the various ways that you have helped encourage us and support us. And we're, we're grateful to get to be here with y'all this morning. So I have a hypothetical question for you. If someone unannounced, unknown to you, just waltzed into your place, whether it was your house, your apartment, your dorm room, whatever it is, and just started going through the place, doing whatever they wanted, how would you react? You'd probably be like, what in the world are you doing? What gives you the right to come into my place and just start doing whatever you want, rearranging furniture, throwing out stuff you don't like? Who gave you the authority to waltz into my place and act like it's yours? Well, we're going to see something similar happen in our text for today. We're in the Gospel of John chapter 2, starting in verse 13, if you want to go ahead and be turning there. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles on the table in the back of the lobby. Please feel free to get up and grab one of those. And if you don't own a Bible, please keep that as our gift to you. And so as a a church at The Journey, we've been walking through the Gospel of John, and uh, this is where we're actually going to be this afternoon, and I thought it would be a a good one to share with you all as well. Um, So while you are turning there, John is in the New Testament. That's the, the part of the Bible written after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and it's one of the first four books of the Bible, what we call Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that are eyewitness accounts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And while you are turning there, Uh, Will you please pray with me? Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. 
that you desire a relationship with us. Even when we have walked away from you, you desired to restore us to yourself. And one of the ways that you do that is by revealing yourself to us in your word, and most specifically, revealing the gospel of Jesus Christ in your scriptures. And so I am asking you to do, we are asking you to do what none of us can do on our own, which is to open spiritual eyes to the goodness, the grace, and the mercy, and the glory of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And so would you use your word to speak to us wherever we are today? And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, So like I said, we've been journeying through John, and one of the cool things about John, uh, sometimes you can read a book of the Bible, maybe a lot of the times you can read a book of the Bible and be like, what in the world is going on here? I have no idea. Well, John makes it really clear at the end of his gospel in John 20, 31, why he wrote this entire book, why he wrote this eyewitness account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In John 20, 31, John writes that he wrote this entire gospel so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John wants you to have life. He wants you to have eternal life. And the only way to do that is through faith in the Christ, the Savior King that God's people have been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds of years. And he wants you to know that this man, Jesus, he is that Christ. And so every part of John's gospel, every scene in John's gospel is all building up to this ultimate point. So John begins his gospel in chapter one with the presentation of the Christ that he makes this bold claim that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the word made flesh, he is God made man, that he is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and that he is the son of God, this coming king from the line of David who would rescue God's people and bring restoration to the world. And then the next major section of John's gospel, starting in chapter two, is the proof of the Christ. So he said, this is who Jesus is. This is my thesis. Okay, sorry to those of you that are wrapping up your your terms if that like causes you PTSD. This is his thesis. And now he's gonna support that with scene after scene after scene that is proving that Jesus is the Christ. And specifically in our text today, this proof is all gonna revolve around Jesus' authority. So in our text for this morning, we're going to see a demonstration of Jesus' authority. We're going to hear about a sign that's going to prove Jesus' authority. And then we're going to see how this demonstration of Jesus' authority actually reveals a deeper heart issue that we all need uh, to be resolved. And so the first movement in this scene is the demonstration of Jesus' authority. And that happens in verses 13 through 17. It says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So Jesus, as a good Jew, is in Jerusalem for the time of the Passover. The Passover was one of the major feasts in the the nation of Israel, part of their calendar year. And in this event, they celebrated their salvation from slavery in Egypt. And so Jews would come from all over the world to celebrate this. And so the system was developed because it'd be difficult to travel miles and miles and miles, not just with your family, but with animals that you had to bring for the sacrifice. So they, they created the system where you just show up, we'll sell you an animal at the door, easy peasy. And then they would have these money changers where they could exchange currency for the currency that would be acceptable for the temple tax. Now, that in and of itself is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually kind of a a good thing. It makes sense, right? It it was a way of, of helping people that were just trying to be obedient to God's law. So what they were doing necessarily was not the issue. The problem was where they were doing it. They were doing it in the temple. Now, they probably weren't doing it in the actual temple building. Most likely, it was one of the courtyards around the temple building. Most likely, it was what we call the courtyard of the Gentiles. So this was the part of the temple complex where the non-Jewish people who were followers and believers in Yahweh, they could come to worship. In fact, Israel, part of the whole point of Israel's existence as you look through the Old Testament was to be a light to the Gentiles, that God said, I'm gonna create a special relationship with you and through my relationship with you and your faithfulness to me, all nations will see who I am and they will come to know me. 
So Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. They were supposed to help the nations worship, but the system and where they were doing it was actually hindering the nations from worshiping. The way Tom Constable puts it, he says, the priests had transformed this temple area from a place of quiet prayer into a noisy bazaar. And similarly, Don Carson writes, instead of solemn dignity and the murmur of prayer, there is the bellowing of cattle and the bleeding of sheep. Instead of brokenness and contrition, holy adoration and prolonged petition, there is noisy commerce. And so Jesus walks in on this, he sees this and he says, this isn't right. Something has to be done about this. And so he goes about cleansing the temple as a demonstration of his authority. This cleansing of the temple is a claim and a demonstration of Jesus' authority to be the one to cleanse Israel. But then the people are asking, who gave you this authority? How do we know that you have the authority to do this thing that you're doing? That's what verses 18 through 22 are all about. It says, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And so Jesus says, you want me to prove my authority? Here's going to be the proof that I'm going to give to you. You destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. And they think that he's talking about this building that is right in front of them, what we call the second temple. So under King Solomon, uh, there was a, a temple constructed, constructed for the worship of Yahweh. That temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. But then about 50 years later, some of the Jews were allowed to return and they began constructing a new temple. And then under King Herod the Great, they, they started to expand to this temple. And that construction project under Herod had been going on for 46 years by the time that this scene takes place. So they're saying, this has been going on for years and years and years, and you're going to raise this place in three days? But he wasn't talking about the temple building. He was talking about himself. Now, why could Jesus do that? Why, why would Jesus talk about himself as the temple? Is this just some metaphor? Well, it is a metaphor, but it's one that uh, has deeper meaning. That in Jesus, so the temple was meant to represent the presence of God on earth, the presence of God with his people. And Jesus, in calling himself a temple, is saying, I am the presence of God on earth. I am the presence of God among humanity. The way John put it in the opening of his gospel. He's, he, John opens his gospel. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then in verse 14, he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally it's, he tabernacled among us and we have seen his glory. And so Jesus his body is the temple because he is the presence of God on earth. And Jesus' resurrection is the sign that proves his authority to be the one to cleanse Israel. But here's the thing. There's more cleansing needed. The temple marketplace was, was just a symptom of a deeper problem. And we see that in the, the next few verses, starting in verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. And when they saw the signs that he was doing, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Now there's this debate about this faith that's referred to. Did they have genuine saving faith? Is that what's going on here? Or, or was it some other faith that wasn't saving faith? Well, I think they did have saving faith because this, this language of believing in his name is the, the language that John uses throughout his gospel of, of saving faith. But I think the problem that's revealed here is that though they had a true saving faith, it was an incomplete faith. So the moment you place your faith in Christ, 
you are forgiven of your sins. You are promised resurrection to eternal life in God's kingdom. You are welcomed into the family of God. You are reconciled to God. You are given the spirit as a sign and a seal of your salvation. That happens instantaneously, full stop. Nothing and no one can take that away from you. But we're not done. We're still works in progress. That we still need this faith to be constantly growing and constantly being renewed. So the way the the apostle Paul wrote it in, in Romans chapter 12, he said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, notice he calls them brothers, believers, by the mercies of God. That Paul has been unpacking the gospel for 11 chapters by this point in his letter, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But even when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that though the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because of that, now live this way. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that verb there is in the present tense, meaning this this ongoing process of renewal, being renewed and renewed and renewed. So my family and I, in our family devotional times, we've been reading through the book of Genesis, and we just uh, made our way through the the story of Abraham. And I think it's a powerful illustration of what we're talking about right here. So in Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham walks on the street, um, onto the scene, God tells him, leave your land and go to the land that I'm going to show you. And I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. And Abraham obeys by faith. And then a couple chapters later in Genesis 15, God promises Abraham that he's going to have, even though he's old and childless and his wife is barren, he's going to have as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. And the text says in Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, God looked on Abraham and said, you see that man, Abraham, he's a righteous man, not because he's perfect, but because he believes, saved right there. But what's interesting as you look at the story of Abraham is right after these pivotal moments, right after he leaves his homeland and heads towards the promised land, right after he declares his belief in God's promises of descendants as many as the stars, Abraham will do something stupid. And you're like, what in the world is going on here? But as you track Abraham's story throughout, you see his faith growing and growing and deepening and deepening. And I think that's an illustration of what's going on here, that these people here, they responded and they had saving faith, but there was still more cleansing needed. This faith still needed to be renewed and to grow and to go deeper that the condition of the temple was simply an illustration of their spiritual condition. The way John Piper put it, he said, Jesus could see through the veneer of religious helpfulness to the heart. It was not flowing from the love of God. It was flowing from the love of money. And what made it worse was that religious ritual and vaunted helpfulness were being used as a cover for greed. My father is not being worshiped. Money is being worshipped in my father's house. And I think part of the the evidence that there's this ongoing cleansing and renewing needed is that this happened again just a couple years later. So there's this debate whether or not the cleansing here at the beginning of John's gospel is the same as the cleansing that's recorded in the so-called synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at the end of their gospel account. Are these the same event that's are put in different places in the story for some reason, or are these separate events? And I think they're separate events because they're, they're time-stamped. We've already talked about how this one in John 2, it, it happens 46 years into the construction of Herod's temple. So we can t- date it precisely to the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And then the cleansings in the synoptic gospels are clearly tied to the Passion Week. So I think evidence that their hearts still needed to be cleansed, their hearts still needed to be renewed, is that even though Jesus made this big scene, even though many people believed in his name, Two years later, he walks into Jerusalem and they're doing the same thing again. Because they didn't just need the temple cleansed, they needed their hearts cleansed too. 
And that's exactly what God had promised to do through the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel chapter 36, which is a pivotal background text for John's gospel, Ezekiel 36, starting in verse two says, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. Remember where this scene happened in John 2? The courtyard of the nations. Ezekiel 36, 23. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God and I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. So God had promised to cleanse Israel someday. And Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of this. I am the one who came to cleanse you. But here's the thing. This isn't just an Israel problem. This is an all of us problem. That we all need a new heart. We all need our hearts cleansed. We all need our hearts constantly and continually renewed. And so I, here's at least three ways, <coughs> excuse me, that I think this need for a constant renewal of our heart can manifest itself in our lives. So one would be spiritual apathy. So some of us, when we first came to Jesus, when we first placed our faith in Jesus, we couldn't get enough of our Bibles. We couldn't get enough of prayer. We, we couldn't wait to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ at church and in small groups. And we couldn't stop telling anybody and everybody who would listen to us about Jesus. But over time, though we still believe, that passion has just little by little waned and faded away. So John Wesley, the, the, one of the great figures of the first great awakening, um, he had these questions that they would use in, in their accountability groups. And um, it's a, an exercise I use from time to time. And some of them are fairly black and white. You know, did you do this? Thou shalt. Did you not do this? Thou shalt not. But the question that is always most convicting to me is, am I enjoying prayer? Not just do you pray, but are you enjoying prayer? Because that's what we're meant to do. We're, we're supposed to enjoy spending time with our Father and talking to Him. And if I'm honest, so often, not only is my life marked by a lack of prayer, but even when I am in prayer, I can't always say that I'm enjoying it. I think that's a sign of spiritual apathy that has, has crept its way into my life. Though I believe, though I have saving faith, I still need my heart constantly renewed. So it can manifest itself as spiritual apathy. I think another way that it can manifest itself is external religion. External religion, by that I mean that we put all this emphasis on outward manifestations. Right, do this, don't do this, which... That in and of itself is fine, but when we focus on those things to the neglect of the inner heart transformation that God wants to do with us, it's not honoring to God, it's not good for us, and it's hurtful to other people. So this can look like just box checking. So if you look at your life, yeah, I'm checking all the boxes. I had my daily quiet time. I was in church. I didn't cuss too much this week or whatever it is. I'm checking all the boxes, but to the complete neglect of what's truly the state of your heart. What's truly the state of your soul? Or it can look like legalism and, and judgment, that we put all the focus on the, the right actions. And when we are doing what we think is the right thing, we see other people not doing it, we think of ourselves as better than them, or we think that our relationship to God is based on how good we are performing. 
And I think one of the most harmful ways this manifests itself is when we look out at the world and we can rightly look at the world and see things that the world is doing and say, hey, that's not right. But we can do it in a way where we're foolishly somehow expecting the world to act like the church. Why should it shock us when the world acts like the world? And rather than just standing there and condemning them for what they're doing, we should have compassion. That that action or inaction that we're seeing out there in the world is really the fruit of a deeper heart issue that doesn't know Jesus. And we should be able to move towards the world with grace and compassion with the gospel of Jesus Christ. An external religion can look like, again, on the outside, you look squeaky clean. You're doing all the right things. You're not doing the wrong things. But another exercise that I will run through sometimes when I'm trying to just search the state of my soul is it'd be easy to say, oh, look, I'm checking all the boxes. But then God will call to mind the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Mace, how are you doing loving people? Not just putting on a smiling face and kind of acting like you love them, but actually loving them from the heart. How are you doing being joyful in all circumstances? because you're so full of gratitude for the grace of God in your life? Is your life ruled by peace or is it ruled by fear and anxiety? How are you doing being patient? How are you doing being gentle? How are you doing being kind? How would Jennifer say you were doing with those things? How how would your children say you were doing with those things? And often the answer is not very good. And to be honest, I've blown it even in this service at some of these things. Because my heart still needs to be renewed. So it can look like spiritual apathy. It can look like external religion. And lastly, it can look like materialism. So materialism can look like discontentment and envy. One, again, that I'm so often prone to, even though God has given us all that we need and then some My eyes and my heart so often don't focus on that, but they focus on what they have. The bigger, nicer house, the nicer cars, the the more experiences that they can give their their children, the, the fancier, more extravagant vacations they can take their family on. Rather than realizing that God has given us so much, far more than we need. If I'm being honest, sometimes in my life, this this manifests itself as shame that. In my career choices, first in education and now in ministry, I have often been surrounded by men that make more money than me. And I can feel shame that I see these other men providing things for their family that I can't for mine. But then I have to ask myself, though I do believe that my understanding of the scripture is that men bear primary, not necessarily sole, but primary responsibility for providing for their families. My question is, by what standard? By the world's standards? You always have to have the nicest, biggest house and then the nicest, trendiest neighborhood with the nicest cars, with the coolest gadgets and and so on? Or is it by scripture standards? That if we have food, shelter, and clothing with these things, we will be content. And then materialism, perhaps uh, most tragically, can even manifest itself in the church. And one of the ways that that it happens is through the so-called prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is the teaching that basically if you obey God and if you pray with enough faith, God is going to bless you. You're going to have wealth and abundance and you're going to be healthy. And if you're not experiencing those things, that's on you. If you're not experiencing wealth, if you're not experiencing health, you must have some sin in your life that you need to confess to God. Or you must not be praying with enough faith. And not only is that totally antithetical to the teaching of Scripture, it's harmful to people. That there are people in my life that I know that have been through horrifically tragic circumstances, and the way the body of Christ responded to them in that moment is, well, what did you do? 
Did you pray about it? Well, if you did, you must not have had enough faith. And then I also know people in my life that don't know Jesus and they don't want to know Jesus. They certainly don't want to associate with Christians. They certainly don't want to walk into a church service because they think all Christians, certainly all pastors are like the people you see on TV that say, if you just sow a seed of faith, in other words, if you give money to me, God's going to pay you back literally exponentially. It makes them want to have nothing to do with Jesus in the church. So materialism can even make its way into the church. That's the bad news, that we need a new heart. We need our hearts constantly renewed. But the good news is that Jesus has the authority to cleanse us. He has the authority and the power to give us a new heart. Not only does he have the authority and the power, he wants to. I don't share all these things about spiritual apathy and external religion and materialism to to shame and condemn, condemn you, but because God wants something better for us. He wants us to be free of those things. And how do we know? Well, the text says that the zeal for God's house consumed him. And we know, because we know the end of the story, The zeal for God's house, zeal for our hearts consumed Jesus to the point of death on the cross for us. The way the author to the letter to the Hebrews said, he said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross for our sake to set us free. And the proof that he has the power to cleanse us, the proof that he has the power to renew our hearts is in the resurrection that though the temple of his body was destroyed on the third day, he rose it up again. And just like he has power to, to, to raise his own life up, he has power to give us new life in him. The apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter two talks about the, the darkness of the human soul apart from Christ. He says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were hopeless. You had zero power to do anything about it. But then in Ephesians chapter two, verse four, he says, but God being rich in mercy, not just a little bit of mercy, rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, not just a little bit of love, but great love. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. He gave us new hearts. He gave us new life in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And then the way the apostle Paul wrote it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he said, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has faith in Christ and has been united to him by faith, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. That by faith in Christ, we are made new. And as we continue in faith in Christ and continue to grow in our faith, we are continually renewed day by day. And so here's my call to action to us today. First, if you are someone who has not yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that today. Your action step is the same action step that we see in the text. Believe. Confess that you need a new heart and believe with gratitude and joy that Jesus came to do that for you. The zeal for his house, zeal for your heart consumed him to the point that he went to the cross for you but he rose again on the third day as a preview and a promise for the new life that you can have in him. Place your faith in him. In a moment, we're gonna have a a time of response. You can talk about these things to God, but then we'll also have prayer prayer partners around the room. I'd invite you to go talk to them about the things that the Lord is stirring in your soul. If you, if you find something in your heart that wants to believe, but there's just some barrier, like talk to us about it. Fill out your connect card so someone from our, our church can, can talk to you and, and sit down with you and listen to the, the, the questions, the, the hangups, whatever it is that you have that might prevent you from placing your faith in Jesus. And then for those of us who, who do know him, for those of us who have placed our, our faith in Jesus Christ, the call to us 
is to be constantly be renewed in our hearts. And there's certainly many ways that we can pursue that, but one practice that the the church has historically practiced over the, the centuries for the constant renewal of our hearts is the practice of confession. Now, to be clear, um, confession, which just means being honest with God about where we see sin in our lives, where we see our continued need for renewal and for cleansing, we don't do that for salvation if we already have faith in Christ. You have already been saved. So it's not like if you don't confess every little thing that you did, God's not going to forgive you. No, the reason why those of us who have already been forgiven continue to confess is because through confession, we find renewed freedom and renewal of our hearts. And so my question for those of us who know Jesus is what are the parts of your heart that still need cleansing? Maybe it's where you see in your own heart evidence of spiritual apathy or external religion or materialism, or maybe it's something else that the Holy Spirit is laying on your heart in this moment. Let me encourage you in our time of response in a moment and and throughout your days, make the words of David in Psalm 51 your words. David said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The Apostle John elsewhere in 1 John 1, 8 through 9 He said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So to sit here in this moment and pretend like, no, I'm good. I don't got anything. Would be to tell a lie. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let me encourage us all to to do some soul searching in these moments. Again, not to wallow in shame and guilt and condemnation, but to take those things to Jesus so he can cleanse us, so he can renew us, and so we can find greater levels of freedom and joy and peace than we have ever known before. Let's pray. Father, we... Thank you that you are a God who is merciful, abounding in steadfast love, who delights in forgiving sinners, who so longed for a relationship with us that you sent your son, that zeal for his house, zeal for our hearts, consumed him to the point of death on the cross. And that on the third day he rose again to show us that we can have new life in him. And all we have to do, Lord, is believe and believe and believe and continue to pursue deeper growing faith and abiding in you, God. So I'm asking you to take this moment, this time, and to do work on our hearts, Lord. Do the cleansing work that only you can do so that we can find greater levels of peace and joy and freedom and contentment and gratitude in you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen.